I love you. I'm gonna miss you. It was a goodbye letter, basically. He had killed himself or was about to kill himself. Actions of mine contributed to a man's death. Those things have profound effects on physicians. We know from the data that half of physicians are burnt out, you know, a third of them are depressed. We're still seeing a high number of suicides for this profession. The stigma around mental illness and medicine is so strong. People were coming to me and saying, I'm a doctor, I don't want it on my record. In general, the medical profession contributes to the problem. The board's mission is to protect the public. The best way to protect the public includes making sure the physician is healthy and well. No physician should be dying from suicide, right? No, I am a killer. That's a fact. That thought goes through your head, and that thought doesn't leave. Actions of mine contributed to a man's death. I was paged to take this patient to the operating room so we could repair his bleeding. We put a breathing tube in to enable a surgery to find the bleeding. When I put in the new breathing tube, his heart rate went down uh, to zero, and it became clear he, he was not going to wake up. And then afterwards, I mean, I did read the obituary for this man. He, he had children, very young. Everything became more like just going through the motions. He wasn't as invested at home with me or after our kids were born. So I was just waiting for him to get back to himself. I definitely cried about this every day, uh, going into work and going home. There's always a sense and a question of like, well, where's the justice in this situation? There's only one way to make, to make this situation right. And that answer was suicide. Physician suicide is a problem. We see bad things happen. You know, we see people die. We see people lose their children. Like, those things have profound effects on physicians. When there are traumatic things that happen, helping the caregivers get through that is not usually the first thought. I had all the materials. My plan was I was going to commit suicide. I'd just start an IV on myself, inject the medicines. I'd stop breathing. Things would take their course in 20 minutes, and that would be that. I opened the door to our room, and there was a spiral-bound notebook and a laptop sitting on his spot on the bed. I'm sorry I'm not there. I still love you and realized the bottom line was that he had killed himself or was about to kill himself. I didn't know what stage of his plan he was in. I was completely surprised because although he was obviously depressed for going on a couple of years, let's say, I didn't know that he had ever thought about it. I didn't know that he was capable of ever thinking about it. I was very angry that he would, from my perspective, destroy mine and his children's lives based on this. The main thing I remember is she grabbed my hand, put it over her heart, just said, well, can't you feel this? You know, why haven't you said anything? You know, why would you want to leave? I got tons of education on how to prevent disasters and accidents. I had no education on what to do if and when one happens to you. 
I think in general, the medical profession contributes to the problem of physician depression and physician suicide. One of the things I learned when I became a physician is that people are willing to tell you their stories. What you learn is that there's a lot of struggle with mental health issues. I got interested in the fact that this was going on in our own profession. I definitely see patients in my practice who are physicians, and they will come to me and say, don't put this on my record. I'm a doctor. I don't want it on my record. So it's okay for our patients to have it. But I kind of wondered, why is it so different for us compared to everybody else? The numbers that we use for physician suicide don't have great data about them. They're mostly based on expert opinion. Suicide is a hard thing to track down because it's stigmatized, that it probably is hidden somewhat because of their status in a community. If a physician committed suicide, it might be reported as something else. Oh, Dr. Jones had an accident. In the research I'm doing now, I'm reading through literally thousands and thousands and thousands of reports of how people died and what situations were going on in their lives. And what my research is showing is that, yes, it does look like physicians have a higher rate of suicide than the general population. I mean, it's worrisome in my mind because A, it's a group that you would expect to have access to care, and B, I know that I am probably way underestimating the numbers. I can remember getting the call as soon as she called and told me that he was that he had disappeared. I think I just knew. They found him. He pulled into a cul-de-sac and then kind of like down a little ravine and just pulled back there and, and shot himself in the heart. This is uh, Glenwood Avenue. It's where I got the sad news about Dr. Hardison. I had to pull over and think for a few minutes, you know, and get myself composed. And it was because I said to myself, this man had the perfect life. He was, he was good at it, whatever he did. It's always in the back of your mind, like, that thing happened. We're the family that thing happened to, that people whisper about. Sometimes I'll wake up and I'll just be so pissed, just so angry. And then other days I wake up and I think, why am I mad at somebody who was so distraught that they did this terrible thing? I can remember patients coming up to me and just saying, oh, you look so much like him. This is a box of all the letters that we got from my dad's patients after he passed. The shock of suddenly losing this wonderful man must feel too great to bear. It's odd, he knew so much about me and I knew so little about him, but I know he was a warm and gentle soul. All of these guys are doctors in this photo. Even though they were my dad's closest friends, he wouldn't have talked about that with them. He had some issues of trying to get help, was afraid that might impact his license. I never thought that doctors would be depressed or need support or things like that, and it really was a wake-up call to me. The stigma around mental illness and medicine is so strong that I don't even think he would admit it to his closest friends. Honestly, I don't even really know if he admitted it to himself. He was 100% positive that if he came forward and said he needed help, that there would be a reprisal of some sort. Since the medical board deals with your licensing, there was a fear that if you sort of admitted that you needed help, it would undermine who you were as a doctor. And they would start digging into things that hadn't even been done incorrectly and that would just result in like smearing your name or losing your license or, you know, just possibilities like that that were terrifying. Most physicians are worried about reporting anything to the medical board. They want to be honest, but they're very, very afraid that if they admit to something, this may lead to a big investigation. So when you start to apply for a license, there's an initial license in every state. The way some of the states are set up now, there are questions on there about mental health, and it might be about diagnosis, it might be hospitalization, it might be treatment. 
if you indicate that you have had a diagnosis or have been hospitalized or that you, you've had impairment from this, then they usually require you to do additional steps. What they require depends completely on the board. The board's mission is very simple. It's stated in statute, basically to protect the public against people who should not be practicing medicine. Question number 30. Have you been diagnosed within the past five years with a physical condition or mental health disorder involving potential health risk to the public? If yes, please provide a detailed explanation. With mental health, we don't go into specifics, but we do want to make sure that our providers are stable individuals, uh, again, to prevent uh, any harm to patients. I think boards are very concerned, understandably so, about patient safety, but we don't have any data that identifying that someone has a diagnosis is, makes it safer for patients. In past three years, you said the board has never revoked, denied, suspended, or restricted, or placed on probation anybody for mental health. Not that I'm aware of. Why ask the question then? That may be a question for the board and our department to review. The first thing I did was I went to my board of the North Carolina Medical Society and I said, and I shared the story with them and I said, we have an obligation to do something about this now. The tragedy uh, opened up some serious discussions with people that are involved in licensure. The medical board revised the question and took the one out that was a little bit more intimidating um, because they recognized that it wasn't helping them in any way and it was, and it was also a message to say, you know, it's okay to, to seek help and you're not, you're not gonna lose your license over. So this is the nation's uh, state medical and osteopathic medical boards coming together to deliberate and to talk about policy recommendations for the states. I was invited to this FSMB meeting to talk about some of my research which has influenced their recommendations to state medical boards about asking about mental health questions. So the Federation of State Medical Boards has done a report on physician wellness and burnout and they have come up with 35 recommendations the first 10 recommendations, which were all about what state medical boards should ask if they're going to ask questions related to mental health. And the first recommendation is, we don't think it's helpful to ask questions about mental health, and we do think it prevents physicians from getting treatment. I think it's pretty big. I mean, this is really the first time FSMB has come out saying, consider not asking these kinds of questions on state boards. Do physicians with a history or diagnosis of mental health problem pose a risk to patients? We have very little data that this is true. In the mental health questions, only half of states asked about current impairment. And many of these states asked about unlimited time periods. So when you were in eighth grade and your parents got divorced and you got dragged to the therapist who felt that you had oppositional defiant disorder, technically, you need to report that. I think if there were more lawsuits where people said, wait, you can't ask me about 20 years ago or have I ever had a mental health problem in my entire life, I think there would be um, more restricted questions. ADA says you can ask whatever you want, but if the question is about whether you have a diagnosis and you make only those people submit more information, that's putting a special burden on people with a disability. There's quite widespread concern that many of these questions would not hold up if they were challenged in a court of law because they're very broad. They don't talk about current impairment.
So every state board, there are 70 of them, has a delegate who is represented here. So each of those delegates is empowered to be here to vote. So it's kind of like a mini Congress. Good afternoon, everyone. I will now call the roll of delegates. Alabama. Alaska. It does uh, have a lot of meaning when the nation state medical boards um, decide to support a particular point of view on anything. All in favor of accepting the document as amended, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Excellent. The motion uh, passes and the uh, document is adopted. Honestly, I think he would be thrilled that something about his life helped somebody and horrified that the story is public. And that's almost, to me, the reason why we have to do it. Because he felt like it couldn't be talked about and it shouldn't be something anybody knew. And I don't feel that way. Even though the world out there thinks that we are somehow superhuman and make no mistakes, we're still human and we still make mistakes. Unfortunately, the consequences of our mistakes can be much more serious. Your recovery is possible. No matter what it is you think you've done or what's happened, it's one of the great parts of life. I don't think he's distant, but I don't think we've recovered everything that was lost during that time. It's like an injury that hasn't fully healed. It's still there. I know every day that there's, there's two orphans. I know there's a widow. I don't know how much good you have to do, how much healing you have to do to make up for the harm you felt you'd done. I don't really ever want to reach the point where I feel like I've done enough where it makes up for that. <laughs>